We're in uh, Pond Street Social with uh, my mate uh, Dale. We're here just talking about some fantastic dishes that you're going to knock up for us today. And yeah. also we're going to just chat about, you know, your history, the history of the restaurant and the group and just about what the food's all about here. So maybe if we could just sort of start off just by talking about what the essence of the uh, Pond Street Social is all about. Yeah, we're a British restaurant. Uh, we try to champion British food as much as possible. Um, obviously it's Jason's first restaurant, it's his baby. We try to be quite simple, uh, but we, we like to put a little twist on some of the dishes we do. So obviously we like to use a lot of Japanese, Japanese ingredients, seasonings. It doesn't make us a Japanese restaurant. It's like we just, we just want to British produce with a different flavour profile, different twist, different direction, enhance what we already have, you know? In, in restaurants, so obviously this is Jason's baby. So. Tell us about what happened at the beginning and just give us a bit of a run up to from a part of history up till now. So when uh, the restaurant opened, I wasn't here, I've been here 10 years mm. and um, it was like a fast paced brasserie and it was just slowly, slowly trying to refine it over the years and, and you know, moving through with trends, British produce, like for instance, our cheese trolley, mm. it's completely British. We do a bit of Irish cheese on there as well, but it was like a decision we made like eight years ago to, to, to make that transformation and try and keep the idea of British produce. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, we, we, we do like to use other ingredients from different cuisines, especially, especially Japanese. Mm, mm. I mean, with the, there's some amazing British cheeses though, at yeah. the moment, and the, you know, like the Tonworth I mean, and the yeah. Baron Beer Garden and all that sort of stuff. Definitely uh, some of the best in the world. With the dishes, do you find like the way that the food has evolved? Like, obviously you've been here for 10 years. So when you started 10 years ago, how, how do you see the journey of been changing for over that time? We've always concentrated on flavour. Um, the restaurant's definitely evolved in the sense of, like I said before, it was, it was a busy, fast-paced restaurant. And now we've got to a point where single, single seating service, so uh, we've not got any rush to try and move guests on to, to replace the guests. And you can kind of concentrate on actual execution of dishes and really get into the flavour profiles of stuff. So after COVID, that, that's something we really, really, really concentrate on. Not that we didn't before, it's just something we had a lot more time to to actually get into the structure of the recipes and why we're actually doing this and just and just yeah we've got a fly yeah <laughs> action <laughs> oh, death what? death from above <laughs> <laughs> if only I had some chopsticks we could have dealt with that quicker what were we saying <laughs> yo using vinegars that we'd normally use I don't know red wine vinegar a traditional French one or and finding like, like what you sent me today, that, that plum vinegar, it really works with the dish that we're going to do. So we're going to do the languacine dish later with a, um, a Yorkshire force rhubarb, which we, we kind of do like an umeboshi style. Oh, okay. So like, we salt it down, nice. um, really concentrate that rhubarb flavour and texture, and then we pickle it lightly. But we've used a bit of that plum, plum vinegar to, to carry on the pickle. Oh, fantastic. So when you changed from being a sort of mixed service to being just one service, that's allowed you to sort of like look at look at the flavors and just go like okay what can we do to sort of like move this to have even you know just to pump it up a little bit yeah having more time yeah having more time to actually dissect everything put a lot of effort into development not not just developing dish but developing recipes you know like constantly trying to improve flavors it could be a dish that's been on the menu for, for years but we're just constantly trying to make it better or improve it or a different change it up, you know, make it a bit more exciting. Yeah, yeah. so do you find that the, this is like the flagship restaurant for the group? Because you've got restaurants all over the world, haven't mm -hmm. you, in the, in the social group, and not just over the world, there's, there's more than one even in London. Yeah. So there's plenty of restaurants, but this is the flagship restaurant. Does this sort of like breed um, like dishes and flavors that get pumped out into the other stores? Um, it does, the, some, some of the dishes will go on to other restaurants and you know, the recipes definitely we will, we will um, share them. You know, it's, but. Each restaurant has its own identity, so, so Pollen Street is quite um, a refined... You know, we, we're a French cooking restaurant with British food, but we like to use different ingredients from around the world. You know, Little Social is a very, very good French little brasserie, little Thai thing. That's their, that's their little brand, if you like. That's their identity. Social Eating House, again, is like a, a, a market, a brasserie, a cool place to go. That's their brand. And then, obviously, City Social, which, which has their brand. This is, you know, very, very good, refined Michelin star food, but you can have a steak and chips, a very good steak and chips as well there, you know? And that, that's what we breed out through the restaurant. So, so if we were to open another Pollen Street somewhere else, it would have the identity of us, you know, refined, modern British food. When you uh, have restaurants abroad, 
do they change again or are they again set that same mentality that's across the group so obviously we just opened city social dubai mm. it's not a carbon copy but it's it's the idea of city social in london going to dubai to be city social in dubai and obviously it will develop as its own little yeah. restaurant but it has the identity of city social you know paul walsh has gone there with jason to go set it up and open it up with dan burke who also was the exec yeah. chef of city yeah. social so it's got a city social for his veins already and that's that's the brand of it yes yeah, so the dna the company's yeah. sort of like running out into all these into all these streams so where do you think that things are i mean obviously you'd have done it by now if you knew this answer but i'm going to ask you it anyway <laughs> where can you see that the that yourself and 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 the team are wanting to push just pollen street or maybe over the next 12 months concentrate on flavors different ideas different produce um we're, we're very happy where we are we just want to keep pushing where we where we're going yeah. and, and make it a fun place to come and dine you know and enjoy the food so even though it's like quite a sort of refined experience you want it to sort of be still relaxed and still somewhere where you know people can come and just enjoy themselves yeah but it's a social company it's um it's about being able to socialize but at the same time if you want to come here have a have a have a nice meal and have limited table service and have a really nice bottle of wine and enjoy yourself and be, be on your own and just not interruptions you can have that at the same time you can sit at the counter and have a chat with me and the other chefs. We have a laugh and a joke. You know, we, we, we always have a little laugh about the football. We have some Liverpool fans in here who aren't enjoying it at the moment. I'm a Forest fan, so I'm really enjoying my time now. So, uh, but you know, it, it's like that. It's, 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 it's as the guest wants. The guest wants quite formal, um, very informative dinner. We can do that. Or if they want to have a fun time, it, 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 it's basically off what the guests, mm. the vibes you get from the guests. So would you say it's like a customer-led experience? Though? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, especially at lunchtime. London, we have a lot of business clientele as well. You know, we, we ask the question, oh, do you, are you in a rush? Do you, do you need to be anywhere at a certain time? They'll let us know and we'll accommodate that. You know, so it's, about, it's about the guests at the end of the day, making sure they have a great time, great, enjoy the food, and they leave happy and they come back. Yeah. So just talking about the, the food that we're going to be having today, um, we're going to have two dishes yeah. and uh, these are dishes that are on the menu and stuff that you know you've been developing and we've been talking about some of the ingredients from us that have yeah. gone in there so this, they are your dishes um, but they've got a couple of bits of our stuff in there so we're going to try them and yeah. um, have a bit of a chat about them. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the dishes? Yeah so um, the first one we're going to do a little uh, languagine tartar so it's a, it's a really cool way of, of, of doing it so what we do is we lightly blanch the languagines take the, take the, the tails out and then we uh, put them into a vacuum pack bag and then we lightly roll them so it becomes like a sheet mm. and then we cut it out give it a little seasoning with um, a lemon oil then we give a little bit of cafe lime zest a little bit of yuzu zest and then we, we serve that with a umeboshi style rhubarb so basically we get rhubarb from yorkshire triangle uh, we salt it for a couple of weeks and then we we gently poach um, poach on the pickling liquid and then we leave that to to really pickle it's bright red and in the pickling liquid, we use, you know, we use plum, uh, plum vinegar. Oh yeah, the Umeboshi vinegar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then with the languagine heads, we make a sauce, which we finish with, uh, we call it our Japanese sauce. <laughs> it's got about eight ingredients from uh, sushi sushi, which <laughs> this is like our Japanese blend. But it's a standard flavor injection. Yeah, exactly. I like it. It's like our, our sauce. <laughs> it's a secret though. Yeah. But we can't say what it is on no. camera. Oh, we can do the ingredients, <laughs> the, the, the uh, recipe. We can give it the ingredients. Go on then, what's, what are eight things? Oh, you're trying me now. Um, scallop dashi. Scallop dashi, bing. Um, tomato ponzu. Oh, classic. Um, the citrus ponzu. Oh, yeah. And five yeah. other secret things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> trying to think what's in there. I had one out earlier. Mirin? No. No. I'm really looking forward to trying them. Should we give them a go? Yeah. Let's do it. Great, cool. So we're um, we sat back down again, and we've got the uh, the langoustine dish. And you said to me something interesting when you were when you were playing this dish up is that like the way what, the way that the restaurant's gone now to you're focusing a little bit more on like refining your existing dishes. You were saying that this one used to be just the tail of langoustine, and now yeah, you've I'm got the new process where you imagine the, imagine out. if we did this dish like four or five years ago, it wouldn't look like this. Mm. Maybe we would chop the langoustines up and we'd push it down into a ring or or we'll just give an actual piece of tail of langoustine rather than actually going through that process of a, just a different technique to serving it, mm. which we've had time to work on that and you know, develop, develop that for us. You know? 
and the colour looks fantastic as well. It really just sort of pops on the on the dish. Yeah. Should we give it a try? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Do you mind if I just crack on? Yeah, crack on. Brilliant. Okay, cool. So, what to eat first? A kind of too beautiful to smash up. I'm feeling a bit guilty. Sorry, we've, we've, <laughs> we've got a picture of it now. Okay, so yeah, that's fine. I'll store it in my memory. Right, okay, great. Let's go. Mmm. Wow. That is genuinely delicious. So you're getting all sorts from that. You're getting the, the, the fresh sort of like um, notes from the kaffir and the yuzu zest really sort of hit you first. And then they come down and get a little sea, seafood freshness, the textures of the, the fruits and, the, and then the freshness of the apple. Yeah. And then you've got that sort of like savouriness of the bisque as well. It kind of got everything that. Yeah. It's like that thing that I really like with sashimi, which is like the freshness. Yeah. But then you've got the sort of like the Western French style of that sort of body as well. It's got, it's really nice. I really like it. I'm going in again. Finish up. Yeah. Well, get me last bit of rhubarb. How's the umeboshi rhubarb? The umeboshi rhubarb is fantastic. That's, that's Kev's idea. It's Yorkshire and Japan together. What, yeah. What's not to like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've definitely got some kind of soy and ponzu sort of like vibes in there. Cause I could, I can taste that sort of tomato and citrus ponzu in there as well. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. You can sort of taste the sort of that roundness of the the fruits, but not mm -hmm. like the sharp acidity of the fruit and the savouriness of that soy sauce is coming through really nicely. But it does taste like a nice bisque. And you don't lose the flavour of the langoustine either. No, not it's at like, all. Like, um, I only know it because I know it. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't, you know, it doesn't interfere with the flavour. Mm. That's really interesting. I really like that. So you're right in the heart of London, in Mayfair, not too far from Soho. So you've got the ability to pull people from all over the place. Do you tend to find that you get like like a local customer base from London or do you tend to get a lot of like people from tourists and stuff like that? Or? We definitely get a mix. I mean, um, lunch times we get a lot of uh, people on the county lines, as you say, coming in from outside London, um, coming and have a lunch, enjoying, having a great day out. Um, and then you know, we, get, we, we do get a lot of people from abroad um, coming just as a destination restaurant, if you like, coming to dine here and other Michelin star restaurants in, in London or in, in the country. Yeah, so it's like a tick list kind of. Yeah, we get, we get a lot of chefs in here as well. Um, a lot of sommeliers, um, front of house, people who, 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 who want to come out and dine in some of the, the best places and you know, we're, we're happy that they come and choose to dine with us. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit about your history before? Because you've been here 10 years now, haven't you? 10 years. So you, uh, you died in the world social guy, but obviously where were you before that? Where did you come up 10 from? 10 years in the um, start of October, yeah. Um, I worked for Richard Corrigan for um, five years. I learned a lot there. Uh, that's when I first came to London. Uh, I learned a lot with him, how to run a kitchen and uh, run a restaurant and make money. Before that, I was at Crayfawn Hall, which is in North Yorkshire, for uh, two years. Um, I, spent a couple, I spent a year at a place called Linden Hall um, in Northumberland. And then before that, I was at uh, Dakota in Nottingham, um, which was my first exec chef was uh, Roy Brett who is uh, now uh, the Ondine. So I spent about three or four years there. I was a pot wash to start with, and then they realized that I actually can do some preparation. So I used to get in at three o'clock and all the veg would be piled up on the side waiting for me. <laughs> and then I've you know, just really enjoyed it. They, they asked me if I wanted to do the summer, end up on pastry for the summer. And I like the banter and I yeah. like the, the excitement of the kitchen. And you know, I, That's I really enjoyed it. That's a great way it. to come up from like, you're saying, okay, I'm just want, I need a job, I'm going to pot wash. And then you're, you're the main guy at, uh, at a Michelin star place in the heart of Mayfair. That's a yeah, pretty cool I mean, story. Yeah, it is. But I mean, I think it's all about hard work, isn't it? I mean, you can get to wherever you want to be, you know? You get as much out as, as you put in. You know, if you're thinking about chefs who are maybe, you know, maybe they've, they've, just, they've just finished being a KP <laughs> mm -hmm. and they're peeling the vegetables now and they're sort of like looking at I this think, and think, what, what can you sort of tell There's a lot of chefs them? who don't go to be a KP to start with. I think it's, a, it's, it's the most important job in the kitchen. If you don't have a KP, you have to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, we're really respectful of our KPs. Um, they do a great job for us. And you know, it's not just about the kitchen, they look after the front of the restaurant, the, um, the path, as you say, the, the little alley that we're in now. And they're like, kind of like the glue to the restaurant. So if you need anything, they'll go grab it for you. They'll make sure this is there, they'll make sure that's done. I think it's very important, that, that role. And I think everybody should have a little, not work as a KP, but have that idea of, you know, that, that's a very difficult job to do. And you should really respect that. And I think it's important to, for like, someone who's someone who's you know a boss not to obviously obviously you need you need to 
managing you need to run the business but you need to have an awareness of every single part you need to have done a little bit of it yeah yeah i mean it helps in understanding what people what situations and what people's daily lives are about and you can understand if something's a difficult process to get through or and it'll just help you run a business and manage a business anyway so if you were like if if like a, a young chef was like to ask you what's what would you what advice would you give them if they want to sort of try and push through the ranks and get towards where, where you guys are at now? I would say just definitely do your time. Don't think you've been in a kitchen for three or four months and you're ready to move on. I think you have to do a year minimum. You have to see the process because it's not just you go there, you get the recipes, you go. It's, 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 it's just the years, the season, you see the kitchen evolve. Go to different types of places. Don't just go to restaurants are 20 covers, 20 covers, 20 covers. You go to different restaurants, different skill sets. You know, you have large operations, you have hotels where you don't just have to look after a restaurant, you have to look after breakfast, you have to do room service, you have to do afternoon tea, but at the same time trying to main standards, maintain standards in, in the restaurant. Um, like City Social, it's, it's, they have a Michelin star, but they also have a huge bar that they have to cater for. Lots of pr private dining rooms there. Um, Burner's Tavern, again. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, it's, it's a hotel, different skill set, but you're still cooking good food. It's, still, it's, it's a learning process and going to see these different types of restaurants and taking all that knowledge because at the end of the day, whatever happens, when you have your own business or your own kitchen, you'll always pull on all those different experiences to make what you have. Yeah, so when you're running your own place, yeah. there's more to it than just cooking, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, and you, might take, you might take away experiences that you didn't agree with and not use that, but that's the experience. It's not about having a wonderful experience every single time and taking away from it everything golden. It's, it's not about that. It's about going through places and you know, understanding why certain places work certain ways and just bringing that all into yourself and using it Amazing. in the future. Yeah. I, I think you're right. I think it's, it's definitely something you've got to think about is like your variety of training. And I think a big, big thing is like, you know, you said, do your time, but you've got to turn up, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> turn up. Don't let people down. I mean, try not to call sick. Obviously, if you're sick, you're sick. But yeah, try and try and do your time. Give as much give as much effort as you can. Yeah, that's 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 most important. Have an open mind. Don't go into somebody's restaurant or business thinking that you're the know it all. And because at the end of the day, that, that's their business. You have to respect that. And that's that's their life work. You know, it's quite a creative job, isn't it, being a chef? But like, if everyone's creative, it's a bit of a nightmare, isn't it? <laughs> So it's like a bit of a battle between you want to be creative, but you want to like, have some standards and you, you, you do need a bit of repetition. Being creative is obviously a very important part of the job. But I think the, the, the hardest thing is to have the, the concentration to, to constantly do, to get the consistency. Doing the same thing every day is, is, is the same thing in, in Japanese culture. Making sake every day mm. or making the same type of sushi every single day and learning your craft to the point where you're so confident it's always consistent. I mean, it's important to be creative and not stop and don't get bored. But at the same time, you have to understand the, the fundamentals of, of running a consistent restaurant. Yeah, I think we're kind of the opposite way around to the Japanese. Is like we're, I think we are really good at innovation. I don't think there's many people or many nations that have got as many innovative people as us. Whereas the, the Japanese are really good at, at drilling things down and perfecting things. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I think, one of the reasons why, you know, when it's working for us is like we're bringing like products that have had hundreds of years of repetitive development. Yeah. They're going down the, the progression, but not in a, in a has, haphazard kind of way. Mm -hmm. And then we're injecting those products into very innovative people in, 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 in the UK. Yeah. But, you know, the innovation is, is one thing, but you need to, like you say, you need to just be completely, once the innovation is done, just put that, park that. Yeah, and, then and, and you, you have to really concentrate on the fundamentals and making sure, not that everything's the same every single day because that's, that's not going to happen. It's, it's impossible for that to happen. I mean, but to try and consistently work, just little things like creating the same source to the same level every single day. It can't be, it can't be really good one day and then the next day it's okay. It has, you know, try and make it amazing every single day and get that consistency into your work. Cool, so um, we've got the langoustine tata. Yeah. And um, what's the other dish? Um, so the other dish is a roasted scallop dish, so it's something we worked on at Pollen Street. Um, so it's basically 
this this is very very it's not like uh, we don't use a lot of japanese ingredients in this we just use a one last last oh, in yeah. ingredient which really gives it a an injection of flavor which okay. really really brings it up and, and what's the word I look for really um brings it to life yeah it does it brings it to life so it's basically a roasted um, scallop dish so orkney island scallop with uh, razor clams and smoked leeks nice. so uh, we make this little language uh, sorry we make this uh, razor clam stock as you would do uh, fish stock but with sake mm -hmm. um and then we once we've once we cook that out we pass it off and we char some leeks in the josper uh, we infuse those leeks into the into the stock um, and then we emulsify that with smoked butter and then we just finish with a citrus ponzu nice. um, and we've got a little bit of parsley oil in there, some pickled turnip um, we've got the sweet leek hearts that were um, from the smoked leeks and then we just finish that scallop with a uh, batarga nice. we, make, we make our own in-house batarga with the, with the scallop rose wow, okay so it's, a, it's only that little ingredient in there but it's... I've spotted it really two ingredients in there Sorry, two seconds. I spotted two ingredients. Yeah. But that's interesting because like a lot of the ingredients that you use and some of the other guys use from us are hidden in there. Mm -hmm. You know, that hidden flavor. So there's a phrase in Japanese called kushiaji, which means like hidden flavor. Yeah. So like the cooking, the, cooking the, the, the clams in the, in the cooking sake, you, you don't need to say that's a Japanese dish. It's just a Japanese process. Yeah. Because that does really build some extra flavor into that. I mean, we, we, we realized we, we started to replace white wine with sake because okay. of the because it, it does, it brings a different, I don't know, it, it, it enhances the flavor. Well, you've got mo the koji in it, will give you that umami. Obviously, wine is a different flavor profile, but great in its, its own way. But you do, if you are wanting to put umami into things, then cooking sake is like a, you know, it's an easy win. Yeah, yeah and uh, of course, if you're sort of boiling things with cooking sake, you're gonna get all that lovely steamed sort yeah. of like koji goodness of yeah. injecting into seafood and they just go so well together. Yeah. It's cool, so um, let's do it. Cool, so we've got the big scallop, and it is an absolute whopper, that is beautiful, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, so you're obviously good, getting looked after. Johnny looks after me. Yeah, he looks like him, man, that is... Because right now, I mean, don't know when the guys are watching, but actually it's quite hard to get scallops at the moment. There was a bit of bad weather, and I think they're in short supply, but that is an absolute beauty. Yeah, I mean, well, we, we, we deep freeze them to minus 40. It kind of mm. makes them a bit more um, softer, tenderizer. So, Amazing. Yeah, I've seen that before. When, obviously, when, you, when you're taking it down to like minus 40 or even yeah. minus 80, you're killing all the uh, different bacteria as well. Yeah. So it's, it, but it also messes with the texture. Yeah. Not necessarily in a bad way. I yeah, mean, yeah. It, it can actually do some interesting De stuff. Definitely with it. tenderize them. Mm -hmm. so we've got we, get, we get a better cook on them as well. Oh, really? Yeah, because if they're fresh, they can, be, they can tense up quite, quite a lot. Sure. Bit, so it makes them a lot more tender. So you don't get that sort of like pull in yeah. tension when you cook them. Exactly. They're a little bit more relaxed and then when, you, when you're eating through, going through it, well, should yeah. we try that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We've got this homemade batarga on top as well, haven't we? Yeah, so we, we take all the big rows off the, the scallop. Um, we give them a wash. We lightly brine them. Um, give them a light smoke and then, um, and then we dehydrate them, not, not, not too much, we don't want them too dry, we want to keep that freshness and, and the bright orange colour. Mm. And the oils looks, looks really stunning actually. Yeah, it, gives it give, definitely gives it um, aesthetically something. Oh, it's a big flavour that, a batarga. It's lovely though. It's not like a big flavour as in like, oh, it's a big flavour. It's really well balanced actually is what it is. Reminds me of your uh, scholar uh, dashi. Well, I love that, but I'm, I am biased. <laughs> That's a pretty cool product, that one. I yeah. love that one. But it's like a just and the salmon one. Like yeah, the, the salmon, salmon one. And do you know what d not many people know about is the Rouse kombu one. So Rouse kombu is like a, it's like a really prized kombu from uh, Hokkaido. It's actually just from the north of, okay. of Hokkaido. There's a volcano off the north side of the North Island. And just around that volcano is, uh, uh, is where all the Rouse kombu grows. And it's absolutely delicious. Uh, and there's a, there's a dashi made from that, like concentrate. That one's really good in stocks, but obviously it's just vegetarian. Whereas this yeah. one obviously would be great with a scallop sort of vibes. But enough talking, I'm going to get involved. So we've got some, some clams, uh, other things so inside the, the stock. So for the sauce is the uh, razor clam stock. Mm -hmm. um, we've got the razor clam meat, which is gent so basically we freeze the razor clams and then we slice them when they're frozen. Um, and then we gently warm them back up in the sauce. We mm. defrost them. 
and then we, we gently warm them back up and then we can control the cooking of them so they're not rubbery, they're nice and soft. They are um, actually, yeah, because clam can obviously get quite rubbery, can't yeah. it? Especially when you're steaming them to open them. Um, then you've got some pickled turnip, some samphire, and then uh, the, obviously the scallop and the uh, batarga. Oh, did you say that the, um, the, the, um, the clams were cooked in sort of like cooking sake, or steamed in cooking sake? Make a stock with the sake. Oh, that's really nice. It's really balanced. You got the old bite of the samphire at the end. Yeah, yeah. I love the textures through it as well. That's delicious. You've got to have that one. I'll let, <laughs> let the crew have that. <laughs> Good shout. <laughs> what would you reckon that the Japanese flavours can bring to a non-Japanese menu? To take it somewhere better? Does it take it somewhere better? Or, you know, is it like... I think, I think it takes it in different directions. Obviously, we have, we have um, umami. We have umami flavours in our cuisine, in European mm. cuisine. Mm. Obviously, got parmesan. Mushrooms hold a lot. Yep. Um, tomatoes. But it's a different umami. It's a different flavour profile. It kind of... Gives a di especially all the vinegars, like the bonito vinegar, really, oh, really yeah. changes the flavour and the profile of dishes. You know? Really just t takes in a different direction and just a different flavour to what we're used to. And it really excites the, the palate in my eyes. I really, really enjoy using them, but not overusing them. That's, that's the same thing as well, not, not going too far into it. Being, being quite reserved with it, not, not over being a Japanese restaurant is it's just enhancing what we have. You kind of got to walk a bit of a line with it, haven't mm -hmm. you? Because like you, you, what you're trying to do is trying to like make the dishes taste better, but you, you really are not trying to make these individual flavors jump out too much. And that, like I said about one thing I would say about this dish is it's balanced and not just balanced in flavor, it's balanced in texture as well. It's mm -hmm. not too oily, it's not too crunchy, but it's got all those sorts of things in it and it works really well. Yeah, very well balanced. You know, obviously, we've always used mirin and soy sauce, and that it's always been part of recipes. But then, when you actually get into it, and the different flavours in it, you've got the aged soyas, you've got um, raw white soyas, and, and different misos. And it, it actually, it's actually a, a whole load of layers of ingredients that you actually really get into. And different ingredients make different dishes taste better, different product. And yeah, it just opened my eyes into to, to what that what that is, Jap Japanese market. It's interesting. Never, never going to Japan. Like I really feel like I've got a lot of access to it. That's nice. I mean, a lot, a, one thing I've always, I always time and time again hear from chefs is like, oh, I'd love to go to Japan for a bit yeah. and really fall into the culture and, and get my head into the food. So like, well, we're, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to bring the authentic side yeah. of Japan into your kitchen. And then, you know, you can get a bit of that knowledge and you can sort of shortcut some of the hard work that we've spent yeah. years and years <laughs> doing but that's awesome. what that's what any any producer or supplier should yeah, do isn't it is you're bringing it to a market that's never had that before mm. and making people really excited about what they're cooking do you think it's going to over the next few years do you think it's going to keep going or where do you see it going i think trends happen i think japan's very trendy at the moment um but i think it's just something that's going to set to stay i don't think it's going to leave i think obviously there's going to be new cuisine that comes along that becomes trendy to use and which hopefully will take things from that cuisine as well and to help improve our food. But you and don't think Japan, Japanese ingredients is a hype, it's here to stay? I think they will. I think I really love Japanese food. I, mean, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. I just feel that it's a trend that we're catching on to and we're taking the best things out of it to improve our cuisine. And there will be another cuisine. Is it the same before, we have the French, we have the, the Nordic, uh, the fermentations, you know, the, um, the curing. Um, I just think that we have that we have that from Japan right now, and um, we, we love using these ingredients, and we're going to continue to use it. And there's going to be new cuisine that gives us another thing that we like to use, and we we'll just move on like that. I love the idea that we're kind of like building our food culture yeah. as we go, rather than just like um, trying new trends and sacking it off and trying another trend. We're actually just sort of like going, okay, this is where the food is now, and it's great. Where how can we push it on? And we're bolting things to that to sort of grow it, rather mm -hmm. than just try it, bin it, try it, bin it. And we're sort of like on a nice, nice journey. Making everything better. Thanks, Dale. Thanks again for having us. It's been great, Pond Street Social. If anyone's uh, in London, they've got to come down and try the food because it's absolutely stunning. And thanks again for looking after us and feeding us. No problem. Welcome anytime.